and welcome to another episode of Be The Bank. My name's Robert Haitha, your host for the best industry resource for the secondary mortgage market, the Be The Bank show brought to you by Fix Notes. Today's a special day. It's my birthday. So we're going to have a little bit of a different show. Um, it's going to be just as action-packed and informative for you as a real estate investor. We're going to be talking the diversification of a portfolio between mortgage notes and traditional real estate. In my case, I, I like rental properties. So let's get into today's episode. It's going to be all about this idea of diversifying your portfolio within the real estate niche. So let's get started. All right, like I said, it is my birthday today, episode number 46 on June 29th. Starting with my story, my interest, my ambition and motivation, what drives me to create this show every month for you. Then we're gonna be talking about the feature today, which is building a, di a, di building a diversified portfolio and the lessons I've learned along the way of doing so. Then we're gonna talk about how to purchase mortgage notes, some asset acquisition opportunities coming up. We have, do have a large trade on the horizon here for our mastermind members. And then finally, we're gonna go over another case study for a mortgage note specifically. So before we jump in and um, start with my story, interest and ambition and motivation, let's take a look around at the uh, wildlife we've got on deck today. Of course, we have our bird feeder front and center right out the window from me. Nobody over there. Let's check out the koi. Got an awesome angle today on the koi. We're looking at the uh, lotus flowers there. And I think my audio is a little low here. Let me turn that up a bit. So uh, you can't really see any fish at the moment, but hopefully we'll feed them by the end of the call here if we've got uh, the battery left in the GoPro <laughs> mounted out there on the pond. Okay, so let's start here with my story. And this is kind of informal. I'm not gonna get into everything here, but it is gonna give you a personal overview if you were wondering, since I don't talk about myself too much on this show, I wanted to take my birthday episode to do so. So let's pull that off and the story so far. So my interests, as you know from um, looking around the room here, you can see that I, I like instruments. I like making music. So I've got a mandolin and a banjo over here. And then on this side, I've got a couple saxophones. I keep turning. Can't make it all the way, but there's a flute, a, a ukulele, and a clarinet as well. I do play all of these instruments better at some than others, of course. Saxophone is my primary. I do love the woodwinds. Um, I love competition as well. That's something that really drives me, but more so than competition is thrill seeking. Like as far as sports are concerned, I'd rather skateboard than play, you know, baseball. <laughs> I like playing baseball and I, I love the competitive edge of working with a team playing a pickup game of basketball or, or flag football. Uh, but the thrill-seeking side, uh, I've skydove before. I'm not going to do that again now that I'm a father <laughs> that's been eliminated by the wife. Uh, but there's also so many fun things to do to get your adrenaline pumping, like uh, riding, you know, 30, 40 miles per hour down a hill on a longboard is always fun. And fun, of course, is my main interest. And that was uh, the current thumbnail of this video is uh, keep life fun, which I think is so important. And in this business and in real estate in general, a lot of us um, focus on scale, but I focus on building a lifestyle business. And I think that's a theme of this show that you need to keep in mind as you create your portfolio, as you build your business, do so in a way that complements your life and the things that you have that interest you and excite you. Um, as far as the ambition, my current ambition is pretty clear. It's pretty concise. It's to grow the mastermind group to a thousand members. We're over 100 members now and we need to 10X that, but I can do it over time. I'm not trying to do this overnight. It's gonna be a long process. And as we grow the mastermind group, the value proposition just continues to grow for the members that are a part of it. We're adding these masterclass series, these video courses included for our members as we go. Every single month we have a recorded call with our members, which everything, including just the network effect of having all these members that are part of the group to work with and do business with and, and partnerships with, um, it just creates such an awesome growing value for being in that group. So it's pretty simple. The ambition right now is to, to grow that group. And then motivation for me is creating a wonderful life for my family and me. Um, that's a pretty easy um, to, to think and, and to say. Now that I have a son, I think my priorities have shifted a lot to, and I've always been this way, thinking future and thinking longer term. Um, but now I kind of have to think about um, ambitions and motivations beyond my own lifetime because I've, I've got an infant now to care for and to um, grow into the future. So 
Also, um, not on this list, but as you know from um, looking around the garden out here, <laughs> I, love, um, I love plants, I love animals, um, and I'm a, a student of life, I think is an easy way to, a concise way to explain that. So uh, that's the personal overview. I said I would make it quick, and that was certainly very quick. Um, it's just kind of giving you a little inside look at what drives me and what keeps me motivated in this crazy world. So let's jump over to the presentation today, real estate notes versus rentals, maximizing the port potential of your personal portfolio. So this was a, uh, a session that I presented to our mastermind group, and this was done in our two months ago, I believe this was um, one of the topics that I went through. So I've kind of made a, a new version of it for this show um, to get a sneak peek as to what we talked about in the mastermind a couple of months ago. And um, you can kind of start to think of the questions and the conversations that developed from this presentation. And you're certainly welcome to leave those in the comments, um, either live, you can comment and we can interact directly here while I present or you can do so after the fact in the comment section below this video. And of course, if you wanna jump ahead to case studies or any parts of this episode or any of the episodes, you can use the timestamps in the description or the chapter markers within the video playback bar. So you can certainly jump ahead to things that interest you. But as far as case studies are concerned, this entire presentation is a walkthrough of some of the deals that I've done over the years. So the first one here we've got in 2013, my first buy and hold rental property. This was a single family property. It was half of a twin in a town for $130,000. And at the time that was a pretty standard price for these types of properties in the market. Now um, there's been a lot of appreciation since 2013, but I think the gist of it, the really important thing to, to focus on here is that I bought it for the current cash flow and the opportunity, the, um, underpriced market rents that we could push up in the future. So cash flowed really nice just with a tenant that was already living there. And then we were able to improve the property to get higher rents in the future. So this was a motivated seller. And I think that's another critical theme here. This seller had a judgment attached to the property and they needed to pay off that judgment ASAP so that they didn't continue to incur interest on that judgment um, amount that they had um, attached to this specific property. So I didn't even know about this at the time, but I saw the judgment on the settlement statement, the HUD at closing, and it didn't really affect my position as the buyer, but it did explain some of the uh, motivation behind the seller getting that property liquidated and off of their books to pay off the judgment quickly. So this was a cash flowing property at the time there was a tenant living in it on a one, uh, one year, it was actually a two year lease at the time, two years remaining for 1200 bucks a month. So that was lower than the market rent for this property. I expected it to be 14, 1500 per month at the time. And at 1200 per month though, it's still penciled. I could pay my debt um, on a 15 year loan with a 3.75% interest rate and make a little bit of profit, but really it was a long-term play in the first place. So I was okay. Not that I was breaking even here, but I was okay breaking even to just start building the portfolio with this first acquisition. It was under market rent, as I mentioned, market rent was over 1500. Um, and nowadays it's, it's substantially more than 1500 per month. So this was my first foray into real estate. I learned a lot from my parents who were buying in the same town that this property was in for my whole life. So I had that built in support system and, and that built in mentorship to really learn how to properly manage this property. So uh, one thing though that I knew that would be in the cards for me was an expansion of this portfolio to the other half of the connected twin. So when I closed on this property in 2013, I looked at the other half and I said, one day I'm gonna buy the other half of this property and have both of these properties in my portfolio, the, the entire building. And believe it or not, the next month, I got a call from the, the owner um, to get a, uh, a deal done with him, to buy the other half. Now the actual deal didn't conclude until 2014, but we were able to lock in a lease option to buy the property within two months of closing on the first half of this twin. So the other half was a little more expensive at 190,000, but I only had to put down $2,500. And that made a huge difference towards the cash flow and the ROI breaking even on this. So let's look at the numbers here and, and some of this, the details. So it was a motivated seller again. This was an out of state landlord with a problem tenant who's actually in prison at the time. And they were open to the lease option. And that was the key for me because I just had closed on the other half. I was in no, 
position to be able to underwrite a, another mortgage. Um, they would not have approved me. Didn't even have the down payment available. I spent all my money on the first half. So I needed to come up with something creative and a lease option was the way to go with a sublet clause so that I could rent out the property while leasing it from the current owner. So that worked out and we signed a lease option at $2,500 down with a $1,500 per month monthly payment. So since the current market rent was $1,500 per month on this side, um, and like I said, the previous tenant was in prison, the property was now vacant, they were able to continue accepting $1,500 per month, the seller, to keep this loan, um, their mortgage, keep that current and make sure that they had some cash flow coming in on this out of state property that they were trying to manage themselves. So there was a lot of potential here. I was very excited about this property because it had a five car detached garage behind the twin that was all on this side's parcel. Um, there was a mature grapevine and a pear tree. And I immediately marketed this property as soon as I had the agreement underway and they agreed that I could begin marketing for my sublet. Um, I marketed it as the Orchard Oasis. It's in the middle of a town, but we've got a, a wonderful property with this grapevine, this pear tree producing fruit, and it went over really well. I got this thing leased out at $1,900 per month the same day that I signed the lease option for $1,500 a month. So that worked out so well. Um, it was actually on, I believe it was on my birthday in 2013 before we closed it because um, that lease option did have to be executed to you know, eventually take title to the deed. But for the first year, we didn't take title. We just had the sublet paying to pay the rent and making that $400 spread every month. So that $2,500 down payment was reimbursed. We got our ROI on that very, very quickly. And then eventually we're able to refinance to pay off the previous owner's loan um, as we executed the lease option. So this was the, um, the property and we still have this in the portfolio today. It's the left side was the more recent acquisition. The right side, you can see my mouse here. This right side was the first half and behind the left side was a huge parcel, a lot of room behind there with the five car garage and, and the larger backyard. And that's why the rents were higher and that piece was a little bit more valuable. Um, but connecting the twin made a huge difference because now we have this entire parcel and have a lot more oppor opportunity to just fix up the entire house and not having to worry about the other half's owner wanting to improve things as we were on that track. So the next uh, deal in our books here is a note. This was in 2015. We bought a non-performing second mortgage secured by a condo. $8,000 purchase price, uh, $27,000 principal balance. This was a loan that I had sold from my primary client to another note buyer. And then that note buyer sold it to me eventually because it was underperforming for them. And it was local for me. This was a, a property, not in the same town, but in the same county as my residential uh, rental portfolio. But this one didn't really work out that great as you're about to see. So equity position looked good. It was fully covered. We were in second position, but the first was less than the value of the property. Um, until interior dam damage was revealed. There was some pretty significant issues on the inside. The property wasn't worth the 170,000 that we thought, it was more like 140,000 and the senior was 150. So we were actually underwater on this and it was not a good buy, $8,000. So the senior status seemed like it was maybe going current eventually, it was some spotty performance, but eventually the foreclosure was initiated. And in order to stop the foreclosure, the borrowers had to file for bankruptcy. And since it was unsecured, there was a chapter 13 unsecured wipe, which means that our second position was wholly unsecured. There wasn't at least a dollar of equity above the senior position to secure against this collateral. And we lost our, our lien in that unsecured uh, wipe in bankruptcy. So really unfortunate situation here, but we did get a little bit less than $1,000 of trustee payments throughout the bankruptcy. So we recouped a very small fraction of our investment on this one. Um, so that was in 2015, lessons learned there. Um, and unfortunately, we did not come away with a winner. But in 2016, we bought a single family residential property, second position loan again, but this one was not non-performing, it was RPL or re-performing. So we were excited to buy this one for $11,000 because it was immediately cash flowing at 280 bucks per month. So this was a great deal. It was fully covered, owner occupied. It already had seasoning. The senior lien was performing. So we were protected there. They were slowly chipping away at the senior to increase the equity position in the property. 
and we had a service with Madison Management and they were sending our payments back to our CAMA plan, self-directed IRA. Uh, SD IRA or self-directed IRA is a great entity to purchase mortgage notes and especially reperforming loans because you can have this tax deferred account that grows over time that you can eventually take a withdrawal from when you reach retirement age. So there are some very important things to consider with self-directed IRAs um, with uh, regulations regarding self-dealing, which is buying and selling assets from your own entities and from self-managing. When you have a self-directed IRA, you cannot actively manage the assets that are owned by it, but with a reperforming loan placed with a loan servicer, there really isn't anything to do there anyway. So this is the perfect opportunity to buy a reperforming loan in a tax deferred account. So very, very passive. Um, eventually the, the borrowers refinanced and paid off the loan after several years of cash flow, and we earned over 30% internal rate of return on this deal. So finally, we got a note that worked out for us. And I think it's important to mention here my own um, limitations with regards to note investing and the portfolio uh, decisions that I can make. So my primary clients, I cannot cherry pick loans out of their portfolios. That would be called adverse selection. I could choose loans and negotiate better prices on them because I have that inside information, which would undermine the fiduciary fiduciary responsibility that my clients have to their investors. So unfortunately, the deals that I buy are based on opportunity when perhaps we're getting other bids on a loan and they don't meet our expectations. And then I can pay more and potentially get a deal there, which has only happened once. And that's our case study later on the episode today. Or if I'm buying loans from other intermediaries, other counterparties out there in the marketplace. So that's important to understand some of the limitations there. I would be way more invested in mortgage notes if I didn't have that limit on my acquisition opportunities. Okay, so let's look at the next one here, which is another property, another rental property. This was in 2017, we closed on a laundromat quadplex. Now this was an exciting deal. We bought it for $400,000 with 100% financing. So something that I've learned in mortgage notes is how to creatively negotiate and creatively structure financing for deals. And in this case, we were able to have a 75% bank loan and a 25% second position seller finance loan. So let's get into it here. It was another motivated seller. He's retiring and scaling back his portfolio. The laundromat's a bit of work managing it himself. It was a little more than he wanted to deal with um, as opposed to rentals where the tenants don't often need help. The laundromat always needs servicing, filling up vending machines, emptying the quarters out and, and replacing the bill changing uh, vending as well. So there's a lot of work to do there and he wanted to scale back. Now, I mentioned this before, the creative financing. We had that three quarters financed by the bank senior for $300,000 and then $100,000 seller carry back junior lien. I did need $10,000 at closing. So while it was 100% finance on the purchase price, I had to pay the pro rata taxes, the closing costs um, for both the loan and um, you know the, the realtors and stuff. So this one did require about $10,000 necessary at closing. So it is a cash cow. This was a great deal um, because it's a coin operated laundromat, three units and a two car detached garage. So there's three uh, apartments, a two bedroom, a one bedroom and an efficiency unit. And then that two car detached garage is rented out to a business in the area who just uh, keeps some supplies there. So rents are actually up significantly in 2022, now up 40 percent, which is kind of ridiculous. But the reason is we had a huge amount of turnovers just this month and they were turnovers with tenants who had been in the property specifically the, the largest apartment the two bedroom um, we bought the property with that current tenant already living there for when we bought it I, almost 10 years and now well over 10 years he's finally moved out who's our favorite tenant so he kept the rents really low for him and it was 1200 a month now it's like 1730 1720 per month and it was all just because we were giving that tenant an under market rent because he was super helpful he'd mow the lawn and he'd shovel the corner lot for us so he was really getting uh the value of his lower rent through the help and the assistance that he would give us as the boots on the ground at the property but now we've got a new tenant installed at current market rents uh the building is entirely occupied finally we had two vacancies uh, three vacancies all this year, um, everything turned over, and now we're back working, operating at 100% capacity. So here's a picture of that property, the laundromat quadplex. 
Um, the fixed notes uh, logo is not actually on it, but I thought that was fun. <laughs> so you can see this uh, doesn't have central air. There's a lot of uh, window units you can see here. Um, this Google Street View must have been taken on a hot day. And you can see the two car garage back here, the efficiency unit here, the, um, the stairway to the second and third floor apartments here, and then the laundromat up front. So this has been a really exciting investment for us. Managing the laundromat actively has been a really cool process. We've learned a ton. It's great to move off of the spreadsheets and the computer and the emails to actually be doing things with our hands every once in a while, fixing the machines, turning over um, all of the vending and everything. And it's been a, a pretty profitable investment as well. Laundromats are cool and we've been optimizing it with when we first moved in new flooring and security systems then 13 new washers, a couple new dryers. We've been improving and updating and making this as best as we can for that uh, lower utility cost and higher uh, gross income. So it's been working out really well and, and been our first foray into commercial real estate. So let's jump over to the next deal here, which is a, another mortgage note, a first position non-performing loan, which we call pre-REO because it's on the way to foreclosure. Um, there's no chance of this loan cash flowing and you'll see why in a minute. But it's a $15,000 investment. Um, it's a canal front property and it's essentially a vacant lot. Uh, but you'll see in the picture there is a structure on it. So there's going to be some demo expenses there to raise it. Um, it's worth about $30,000. So we've got equity. It's a pretty good deal. This was purchased directly from the bank who originated the loan. They're a portfolio lender that holds the debt when they, when they originate it. And it's actually a, a local bank in the same town as all of these other properties that I had my first bank account in when I was however old you get a bank account, like 12 years old or something. Um, so it's really cool, full, full circle here to be on the other side of a transaction with this bank um, to purchase a mortgage note from them and build the relationship for future deals that are local to the rest of my portfolio. So this specific one, um, the borrower has been deceased uh, for several years. There's no estate. So our, currently our attorneys are seeking the relatives to either have a deed in lieu of foreclosure executed or to make sure that they are noticed upon a foreclosure action so that we can gain clear title to the property. The taxes are non-performing as expected. I had to pay $8,000 this year to bring the past two years of delinquent taxes current. And we've got it serviced um, essentially by our legal counsel. They're working through that foreclosure or the deed in lieu of foreclosure. Now, a deed in lieu would be preferred here. We'd like to have the current relatives, the heirs to the borrower sign over the deed to us so we don't have to go through the foreclosure process, but it may become necessary to foreclose. And that's a matter of um, really their decision to cooperate or not. Um, but at the end of the day, this property is a blight in the neighborhood and something needs to happen because it's basically just falling apart. And there's been some big floods um, in this past year, which have just further condemned the property. So we do need to get that back under um, good management and then build a new property, uh, build a new home on it. So um, the strategy here, as I mentioned, was to raise the dilapidated structure and we wanna build a modern flood proof rental here. Um, it's a really cool lot right on the, on the canal and behind the canal is the river. And um, you can get a view of both during the seasons when you know, there aren't leaves on the trees. Um, but during the summer, it's really cool. You can kayak down the canal, then hop in the river and float with the current all the way back to where you started. So it'll be a very cool spot for an Airbnb type of short-term rental. We just want to build a really cool modern property there. And that'll be something that I keep you posted. Maybe um, the next birthday episode, which <laughs> I did look at when June 29th falls on a Wednesday and it's every 11 years. So maybe 11 years from now, we'll have another birthday episode and, and share that with you. Hopefully sooner though. So that's the uh, property there. Um, all these cars that are in the driveway are actually the neighbor's vehicles. And shortly after acquiring this note, I got a call from the neighbors saying, hey, what's going on? We wanna buy that property. And unfortunately I'd explain to them that, you know, we don't own the property, we just own the note. It's a long drawn out pro process to even get the deed to the property. Um, but I wouldn't sell it to them anyway, since we've got a, a dream on this property to begin with. Um, and since the flooding, which was <laughs> after this photo, it's in even worse shape. Um, so let's go over to the takeaways here and talk about some things that I've learned across the, the journey of building this portfolio. So first is diversification of knowledge. Um, I'm very real estate focused, as you can see. 
Um, so the diversification within the asset class is kind of limited. Um, but I will say that my acquisition strategies and assets within the real estate sphere have been diverse due to the continued education of creative financing and my entrepreneurial outlook to create things um, to, to make win-win situations for my sellers and to just see the potential in these opportunities. So that's the diversification of knowledge, which I believe you can take from the mortgage note space into any sphere of real estate or even business in general to maximize the, the set of tools that you have available at your disposal. So by watching this show, you're absolutely getting a leg up, not just in mortgage notes, but in real estate and business in general. Um, and I truly believe that the diversification of knowledge, bringing learnings from different fields um, or even just related fields like notes versus rental properties can give you that extra edge um, to make the most of things. So next takeaway here is that relationships are priceless. So you really wanna avoid contention with your valuable counterparties. Um, and sometimes you don't know that they're a valuable counterparty until way later. So you just have to really treat everybody um, the right way and to avoid that contention. So um, the, the learning here is to eat the expense when you can afford to. So you can be the best person to work with and reap the rewards later on to work with a, a counterparty going forward. Now, I will say something about the deal we bought, um, this last one we just mentioned, the canal front lot with the non-performing first position. I ended up paying more than the principal balance on this deal. And it was a misrepresentation by the bank when they sold the loan to me. So originally they said, we'll sell you the deed. We're going to foreclose on the property. And as soon as it's foreclosed, we'll, we'll sell you the deed for $30,000. And I said, okay, okay, that makes sense. It's pretty fair. Um, I can at least lock it in now. But then they said, well, we actually have another opportunity. What if you buy the note from us for $15,000 and you do the foreclosure yourself? I said, well, that sounds like a better deal for me since I'm in the mortgage note space. So that's what I ended up going with. Little did I know until I got the loan sale purchase agreement, but the principal balance on this deal was less than $15,000. Now the payoff amount was closer to 16,000. So there was somewhat of a discount on the principal, but I was essentially paying more than par value, more than the principal balance owed um, for this deal with the speculation that I'd one day own the deed to the property at a discount. So when, when I realized this, looking at the purchase sale agreement, I did explain to the banker that, you know, we don't pay more than the principal balance. Um, but in the interest of building this relationship, we'll move forward with the deal as agreed and we'd be happy to pay 15,000. Just keep us in mind on future opportunities. So by essentially wasting a couple thousand dollars that we could have taken a hardball stance to negotiate. We focused on the long-term relationship with this bank towards getting future deals in place and being a great counterparty to work with. So you can translate this into some of your own deals with regards to buying portfolios of loans and finding loans that may be misrepresented where you can eat the expense and then balancing that against the misrepresented loans where it's really a non, you know, a non-starter. You really have to pursue a refund or a repurchase of those types of loans. For example, I think there's a threshold for everybody based on the deal size. And I've heard of some of our mastermind members buying loans for $25,000, $30,000 that turned out to be unsecured. And that seems like a pretty big chunk of change to be able to enforce the loan sale agreements, uh, representations and warranties. If that loan was represented as secured and it became unsecured, that's a worthy cause to fight for when you're burning $30,000. Whereas a thousand bucks, 2000 bucks, if a, a deal in your portfolio ends up being unsecured at that level, you can certainly let the seller know and maybe they'll proactively refund your money on those deals, but they would also see a bunch of good faith if you explain the fact that, you know, You'll, you'll make it up on the next deal and you can build that relationship going forward. So it is something that you need to discuss with your business partners and you're just internalized on your own as to what that threshold is where you, know, you can create some contention because of something that go has gone wrong in a trade. And in the past, we've had deals with counterparties that have completely misrepresented portfolios uh, to the to the extent that they're basically stealing from us. Um, this was some of my uh, clients who've done trades with less than savory sellers. And those types of deals, you have to go to court because there is no relationship there. You're dealing with a, a fraudulent seller in the first place. So another takeaway, final takeaway here is to stay the course. Invest early and often, create a plan and stick to it. 
Unlike uh, stocks or crypto or other types of assets where you can do a dollar cost average type of approach where you're investing a small amount over time, mortgage notes do require a more focused acquisition strategy. So to pursue uh, investments in mortgage notes, you do have to continue to keep looking out there for deals and building the relationships with the sellers even before you're ready to deploy the capital. But by creating that plan and sticking to it and deploying funds on maybe a quarterly basis or a monthly basis, if you're able to, you're able to continue to grow that portfolio over time and then adjust and pivot when necessary. So an interesting um, anecdote here, an interesting uh, fact of math, frankly, is that 1% of progress every day equals a 37x improvement over a year. So you can apply this to really whatever type of 1% um, gain that you'd like. Um, we call it a 1% improvement on this chart. So you can see 1% or better gets you over a 37X from your starting point. Whereas you can slowly dwindle if you're at a 1% decline. So that might mean 1% um, improvement in skills and knowledge or a 1% growth of your portfolio. And if you can keep that up over time, you will reap the dividends for sure. So before we jump over to our next section here, let's take a quick uh, look around the, uh, oh no, our Koi Cam. <laughs> the Koi Cam is already dead. So uh, I guess we won't be feeding them today. Um, well, we will feed them, but it just won't be on camera. Sorry guys. And no birds either. So we don't have much wildlife to celebrate our birthday with today. So <laughs> let's go to the next slide here. Next we'll be talking about Asset acquisition opportunities, assets for sale. So I do, as I mentioned, have an exciting opportunity to explain to you guys, but first I wanted to show the aggregated trade desk in the Mastermind membership page. So if you are a member of the Mastermind group, you join our portal and you can get access to all of these opportunities from around the industry. But the best opportunities, in my opinion, are the ones coming directly from my clients. And we do have a new portfolio coming out very soon here. This is coming July and August. I think it'll probably be August at the latest. 6.7 million of non-performing first and second liens. This is the first I'm mentioning this to anyone. So uh, get excited because these are going to be great loans. Mastermind members are going to have the first look and the ability to bid on these loans first. Um, we do have a $50,000 minimum purchase size, which... It might sound a little bit high, um, but I will tell you it is actually great news because our last portfolio, we ended up selling for several million dollars and the biggest buyer who took down the whole trade outbid everybody, even the smaller buyers who are bidding one-off assets. So this time around, we're carving out the portfolio into multiple subsets so that we can have smaller investors participate competitively. So we are having a $50,000 carve out is one of the opportunities to bid on. And you can certainly, um, I think we're doing 250Ks, 100K, and um, a 500, couple 500K chunks, and then a, a million, uh, maybe one or two a million dollar chunk uh, subset as well. So I'm gonna explain all these details to our mastermind members very soon here, but I wanted to share it now first so that you guys have some advance um, heads up to join the mastermind group. Now, a great part about the mastermind group is we have a money back guarantee for your first 30 days. So if you time it right, you can get in, review all the assets for sale, and if you don't want anything and you aren't impressed by all the features and uh, benefits that we offer, you can leave the group, get a refund. So that's an opportunity for if you'd like. Now, I want to take this opportunity um, to talk a little bit more about the mastermind group. Uh, the Mortgage Note Mastermind Group is absolutely the best value proposition in the industry as far as learning and mentorship and getting better to create your network and to build the resources you need to maximize your success in the space. We have two seats remaining at $120 per month. You get asset, uh, asset purchase opportunities, our masterclass video courses, our private events and Zoom calls, the vendor database, the forum and activity feed, case study details from all the case studies we do on the show, our county and state level database, templates and calculators, the aggregated trade desk, and 50% off consulting with me. Um, so we've got two seats left at 120 bucks per month before we move up to 130 per month. With every 10 new members that join, we increase by $10 per month, which it aligns the value proposition with the expense that you'd expect to pay. So eventually this will be over $900 per month. You can be an early adopter and join the first 100 members who've already joined at this extremely discounted price. So I wanna talk about that masterclass video course for a minute here. We do have a schedule of quarterly releases for our masterclass video courses. We've already got our first one on bulk portfolio due diligence. And our second course 
is on how to find and close more deals. Now, I think I can show you. All right, we've got our masterclass on bulk due diligence. This is the first course, uh, learn how to analyze thousands of assets efficiently. It's so organ organized into these five lessons. Um, going through everything from your initial data scrub to your conclusive review. And as I mentioned, these are video courses. So you get your, oh, well, I'm not logged in at the moment, <laughs> but you get a video as well as a backing text that has a little bit more to copy and paste formulas. And then there's also links to download the spreadsheet that we're working on together throughout these lessons. Now, something really, really cool about this first video course on the bulk due diligence is in our mastermind monthly calls, we've been reviewing a portfolio activity as we've went through the stages of collection. These are non-performing loans that we've been working with borrowers on getting modifications and payoffs completed. And we've talked about this on a monthly basis with our group to show as the portfolio develops the success rates across different tiers of the, the portfolio and how we've approached our collection process. Now with this masterclass bulk due diligence course, we went back in time to actually do the due diligence on the same notes that we eventually were collecting on and discussing with our members. So by reviewing our monthly, the recordings of our monthly call, you get an idea of what actually happened to these specific loans. And then by reviewing this course, you can actually see the process that we use to acquire said notes. So it's like the full life cycle of a 300 asset portfolio that you can see from front to, to beginning, sorry, from beginning to end, which was really cool. And I think tied off things nicely. And then our next course, which is currently in process is Masterclass Secrets to Sourcing, how to meet sellers and do more business with them. Um, so this is four modules, the who, sources of notes, the where, conduits to relationships, the what, strategies and tactics, and the why, to scale or not to scale to close more deals. So very, very exciting to um, produce this next course, The Secrets to Sourcing, because it is without a doubt the most asked question in this space. How do we buy more loans? Where do we find loans for sale? And then since we've got the due diligence course already, how do we actually buy notes has already been answered for you. So very exciting to um, keep this cadence of quarterly courses up and our Q3 course is still in motion. I think we're going to do Microsoft Excel and then Q4 is efficient portfolio management. So this first year of masterclass video courses is going to kind of round out your initial experience in the mortgage note space and give you the tools you need to supplement everything that the mastermind course already offers uh, through our portal. So I want to pitch one more part of the mastermind course, which is the numbers only recordings. Um, we've had tons of our members present awesome topics to our group on these monthly calls. We have two sessions per call from a ton of different people that you probably recognize their names. They're conference speakers, they're uh, active, sharing their knowledge on social media, and there's just so much there for you, all recorded um, Zoom recordings that you can access as a member. So once again, two seats left at 120 bucks per month, next 10 spots at 130 per month. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions at all. And it would be a nice birthday gift if you try it out. There's a money back guarantee, so it is a risk-free offer to try out the Mastermind membership if you're serious about this industry and building your business in the mortgage note space. All right, so let's come, jump to the next uh, part of this call, which is the case study. I have one case study today, and in the theme of things, oops, um, in the theme of, of today's call, this is going to be a, a loan that I purchased. This is probably the best deal that I've had because there was an interesting situation with my client where I was actually authorized to make an offer on and purchase a mortgage note. So let me explain how I bought this reperforming second position loan, a cash flowing second position secured by single family residential property with a payoff of $367,000. So this hasn't paid off yet, but it's a big one. And I'm very excited for the eventual refinance that this borrower is on in the process of completing. So, uh, our first step here is to review the numbers. The fair market value on this is 1.5 million. A $522,000 senior is in front of us, leaving us $978,000 of equity to secure our principal of $367,000. So this is a big loan, and this was a, a pretty sizable investment for me. Um, definitely a risky, not risky, but um, a, a gut check, put, putting, put it that way, because I had to write a check for $156,000 which at the end of the day was a great deal, 42.5% of the principal balance. And the reason it was significantly lower than some other types of, of reperforming loans was because 
the monthly payment amount was relatively low. Um, I wasn't getting a great cash on cash return on this deal, but once again, looking to, to the future here, there was a lot of opportunity and upside with this borrower eventually refinancing. So we always ask, what happened? Where are you now? And what do you wanna do? The three questions we really need in order to craft a solution for a borrower that's a win-win. And in this case, the borrower was living beyond their means, but they're getting back on track, which is great news. They've got um, some opportunity here. The primary borrower is the CEO of a startup cannabis brand. The co-borrower manages a local real estate brokerage, high performing people. They have plenty of equity in the property, but they're struggling with cash flow at the current moment, which was a couple of years ago when this modification was completed. They needed the lowest monthly payment amount option available uh, with a limited down payment. Um, so in this case, what do they want to do? Well, we offered an interest only modification. An interest only modification is an excellent tool in your toolbox as a non-performing mortgage note investor because it lets you keep the monthly payment amount as low as possible. Now on the borrower's side, they're not paying down any principal, but they're making monthly payments that are very low to keep the loan current. Now, if you're, um, if you're sitting on the other side of this deal and you're like, well, why would anyone want to just pay interest payments? I can assure you that there's absolutely a strategy for it because I've taken out interest only loans myself. That deal we talked about earlier on the call, the laundromat 100% financing deal, the junior lien, the seller carry back second position mortgage for $100,000 from the seller of the property. I structured that as an interest only mod with a $100,000 balloon payment at the end of the term. This allowed me to have really good cash flow for that five year term where I was making the monthly interest only payments. We paid it off early, thankfully, uh, but in this case, it kept our cash flow really positive as we started off the process. In this case, the, the borrowers wanna make sure they keep the loan current, so they're happy to pay an interest only payment with the knowledge that they need to refinance and pay off the loan in full very soon. So in this case, we started with a monthly uh, payment of 1502 per month and eventually increased to 1740 per month in year two. So they could see that there was um, an incentive as the interest rate increases to make that payment go up. There's an incentive to refinance early because there's no prepayment penalties. And by the end of the term, they need to refinance the loan or to put a new modification agreement in place. So we actually just reached the term, the maturity on this loan um, but since the borrower was not able to refinance yet, we're gonna continue to make those 1740 per month payments. We've gotten this um, little bit of a temporary payment plan until the end of the year, where hopefully they'll have it refinanced before then. So it could be a really nice payoff for us in the near future here when this loan is finally refinanced. So over the course of many, many months now, since it's been cash flowing for several years and $1,200 of expenses, we're on our way to that $367,000 payoff. And a couple of takeaways here for you. Um, so as an investor, you really wanna capitalize on these rare opportunities when you have a strong conviction on the prospect and you can take that leap of faith. So the opportunity for me was very rare here because um, the client in this case, my, my portfolio client who I was actively managing these loans for, they needed to raise some funds for another opportunity outside of this business um, doing a multifamily syndication or like a self storage deal. So they needed the money on this loan. They wanted to sell it cash out. And I marketed it to our whole group. And we only got the best bid that we got was for 154,000 or it might have been 155. And I told my, my client here, this isn't the best trade for you. Like it's worth more than that. Let's hold it. Let's work on another trade. Let's get another deal sold. And they said, well, we want to sell this loan. So if you think it's worth more, you can buy it. And I said, score, absolutely. I'll bid a thousand dollars more and buy it for 156. And they went for it. So this was a rare opportunity for me because it sidestepped that adverse selection. It was approved by the client to get the loan monetized. And I was able to basically have a more of a, a runway in timing where I didn't need the funds right away. So by the time this loan pays off, it'll be a, a sweet um, lump sum from the refinance. So another takeaway here is to work with the borrowers on a long-term vision to support their financial situation. So by calculating your investment returns based on the risk reward and upfront payment versus payoffs on the horizon, you can essentially pay more than another investor who may be just focused on that monthly return. Now the cash on cash, on this loan isn't great. As I mentioned, we haven't gotten the payoff yet, but the cash on cash return uh, was only 11.4% in year one. 
Now, that's pretty good. I mean, double digit returns, especially in today's market, are, are great. Um, but it was certainly less than you'd expect on a 100% covered. I mean, it's it, there's the CLTV here, the combined loan to value, is well less than 100%. We've got plenty of equity coverage here. So you'd think that the return um, at 11.4%, I was comfortable with that. And then year two, 13.3% since the payment amount went up to 1740 per month. That's a pretty solid return as well. But really what we're banking on on this deal is that payoff when the loan is refinanced. So that's it for the case studies. We just had one today, um, which I thought was nice to go with the theme of working through some of my own assets, my own portfolio. And that's pretty much it for today's episode. I'm um, hitting the golf course for a couple of holes here to celebrate my birthday. So. I'm gonna call it a little bit earlier than normal. But as always, it is my pleasure to present this show to you every single month. We have a lot of fun on the Be The Bank program, teaching about mortgage notes through our own experience, as well as the things that we're seeing in the market going forward. And that's a big theme of the Mastermind Group. We're talking about all sorts of developments into the future with regulation and licensing, and how to maximize your ability to succeed in this business going forward. So as I said before, please check out the Mastermind membership. It is the best value opportunity in this entire space to learn the business or to take your business to the next level. And like I said, it's a 100% money back guarantee for the first 30 days. It's a risk-free offer to try it out. I know I'm hard selling the Mastermind group this week because we are growing to a thousand members sooner or later here. And you can be one of the first at these well lower than ever before pricing um, before we increase it as we go. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been the Be The Bank Show. We'll be back the first Wednesday of the month uh, for our mastermind call and the last Wednesday of the month for this Be The Bank Show. So as always, tune in for the industry overview, the tech tips, the vendor reviews, assets for sale, case studies, giveaways, and so much more on the Be The Bank Show, last Wednesday of the month. See you next time, everybody. Thanks for joining.